to the Toes on the Line podcast. I'm your host, Gio Grassi. Today, I'm bringing you someone who I've known for some time, and we'll talk about how we met, and it's kind of weird, and it's funny at the same time. Derek Stein from Eastern Illinois University. He is the director of football performance, and Derek's been north, east, south, somewhat the east of the Mississippi River your whole career, I believe, and then <laughs> didn't touch... Didn't touch anything on the West Coast, Northwest, Southwest yet, but I believe you might get there if you have any interest <laughs> in getting there. Derek, what's up, brother? What's going on, Gio? Same old shit, man. Let's uh, let's dive right into the shit, man. The people want to know who is Derek Stein, and we'll talk about how we met first, and then we'll talk about your path to where you got. And it's funny because Derek, you could actually go ahead. You say the story, man. You say the story. I'm talking too much. Yeah, at the at the time, man, I was I was still a GA actually here at Eastern Illinois. I'm in my second stint here now, but I was looking for a full time job. I had just finished up and graduated, and I was just trying to get my first full time position. And you know, Coach Gilfeder had had called me and had the phone in with, interview with you guys, and you guys ended up bringing me out for to interview in person. So came out and interviewed with you in person. I didn't end up getting it, but. You and I stayed in contact from there on. That's how I rolled, man, because when I first interviewed myself for Fordham back in 2017, this was at the end of my internship with the Giants. I didn't get the job, but I stayed in contact with the coaches there because I'm, I'm not the type to burn bridges unless I really don't like you. Right. Same job opened up in January 2018 and then I uh, interviewed and uh, I mean, barely interviewed. <laughs> Coach Greer gave me a phone call and hired me on the spot. So uh, that's how I got there, man. So. Yeah, no, Derek, man, I've, I've loved keeping in contact with you because I love your content, the stuff you put out there, your coaching methods, your philosophies, you know, your programming ideas and stuff like that. And, you know, you know how we've been bouncing ideas off the wall and shit like that has been pretty dope, man. Yeah, it's been awesome. No doubt. So we might talk a little bit of programming today, but let's let's switch gears now. Let's talk about career path, man, because you had a pretty interesting career path. And at a young age, you know, you said this is your second stint there at Eastern Illinois. You went from an intern, no, a GA. Were you an intern before GA? I interned at Arkansas State before that, yeah. Okay, Arkansas State. Damn, I didn't even know about that. Shit. I, was, I, I was a director at a Division three before that. No, sh- damn, look at that. I'm finding out a bunch of new shit, man. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like when you're dating a girl for too long and you're just finding out the new shit about her, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, my. Um, but yeah, now you're a director, uh, but you were formerly a GA there. So let's talk about your career path, where you started from. Um, as an undergrad and then to where you got now. Yeah. So I did my undergrad at George Mason University in, in Fairfax, Virginia, which is where I'm from. I grew up, lived there for 22 years. Years, So, I mean, you already know I'm a diehard Washington football team fan. That, that's why. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, as my capstone internship, finishing up my exercise science degree, I did my first internship in the private sector with Exos down in Texas. From there, I ended up getting a part-time position at a Division three in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. If you don't know, like there's the Mitten of Michigan, and then there's the Upper Peninsula, which is like a whole different world up there. So it was like three hours up into that whole section in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I spent a year there as a part-time. I ended up being promoted to the director there for about six months. Um, and I just, I just felt like I was going to get stuck and I didn't want to get stuck at the division three level. I wanted to continue to, to progress and ended up taking an internship at Arkansas state university. So I was there the spring of 2017. And upon completing that, I got offered the GA position here at Eastern Illinois. So I ended up coming here and that was, that was, I mean, that was uh, through a mutual connection the previous GA in my position got promoted to director because the director left. So he called, he had a buddy at Arkansas state. He called him and said, Hey, do you have any interns that are good? So he, uh, he recommended me and, and that's how I ended up getting in contact and, and getting the position here the first time. Um, so here I assisted and traveled with football. I had baseball, soccer throwers, and then I assisted with track and field. Um, and at the end of that stint, uh, we changed football coaching staff. So the previous director that hired me ended up leaving for a different position. We brought, brought in a whole new coaching staff uh, from Northwestern, Coach Adam Cushing, and he brought with him Coach Joe Roscoe uh, at the time. So I got to help them with the transition here. That was my last semester here. And that was when I was heavily applying for jobs and looking for a job. 
And uh, at some point along the line in there is when I interviewed with you guys, I just still didn't have anything by the time I completed my GA in the spring. And I had done a good enough job to impress them that they, they kept me on the GA stipend throughout the summer. It was the first time they'd done that to nice. help me bridge to the next job. And, you know, I still didn't really have anything. I ended up taking a paid internship at Louisiana Tech on the Olympic side under Blake Talos. So that was kind of a, a whole new, a whole new experience outside of my comfort zone. I'd always wanted to be football. Now I was basketball, women's basketball, and a boatload of other sports. Spent some time there. I got through basketball season. Then after that, uh, happened to have my my women's basketball coach at Louisiana Tech knew the athletic director at Northwestern State because she had just come from there a few years earlier. And uh, they had just gotten a new head strength coach. I didn't know who it was. It, it was Eric Schwagers who they ended up hiring. I had no previous contact with him. But my basketball coach contacted their athletic director, put my name in. And it's funny, you know, you never know when you interview with someone who knows who. So yeah, just before going to Louisiana Tech, uh, one of Eric Schwager's previous assistants, Chris Duguay, had taken a position at Kaiser University in Florida. And he had a full-time position open at the NAIA level. So I was put into contact with him. I interviewed with him. I didn't end up taking it, but – I had a good interview with him and he actually, without me knowing, ended up recommending me to Eric at that position at NSU. And that's how I got that position. He had my name on his radar and I didn't even know it. Nice. That's, that's fucking dope, man. It's wild how that plays out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's crazy. How the hell do you end up on someone's radar? <laughs> I honestly have no idea. Like I just, you know, I interviewed with, with Chris that one day and I just didn't want to go. NAIA, and I knew I was going to be in a good situation in Louisiana Tech. I knew Kurt Hester was there, someone I wanted to get to know. I ended up being really busy with in-season and a couple other teams, so I didn't get to talk to him as much as I wanted to, but I knew that was the route that I wanted to go. I'd heard, heard great things about Blake Talos there anyway, so it, it just worked out, and you know, funny enough, I think that was one of the things I wanted to touch on today. I mean, you never know who's listening and who's watching, and you never know who knows who, because... Uh, and when I was a GA here the first time, let's say within the first month, uh, Coach Orozco's sister was getting married. So he had to, he left to go to that, obviously. So I essentially took over his role as the director for a half of a week here. I ran everything on my own. Granted, everything was already programmed. I had had some familiarity level with what he wanted to do. And from there, it was my show to run for half a week. And I just took advantage of that opportunity owned it and that's what got this football coaching staff on my side and god rest his soul when coach orosco passed away i was their first phone call to bring me back here i was excited to do so for what the circumstances are it's it's sad but it's cool as hell that they were able to you know keep you in mind on their short list and say hey look you know we got an open director position and it's funny because that's like a that's like a job everyone wants you know everyone and I always get like people I know ask me, hey, how did you get on with the Giants or how did you get to where you're at? You know, what are some steps I need to take? I even have like former uh, athletes I used to coach, you know, shoot me a text or a DM saying, hey, coach, how do you become a strength coach? And you know, the first thing I tell them is, hey, you want to put your time in as an intern for some quality coaches that have a great networking base. You know what I'm saying there? Yeah, for sure. And I, yeah, and I just think, you know, I don't know, everything's just, everything's just built and, you know, media portrays, you know, money as the king. And don't get me wrong. You got, you got to get paid, man. You got to know your fucking value. But if you're trying to break into the field, listen, you got to put some time in. You got to put some hard work in for for, uh, for nothing. What, what's it called? Sweat equity, right? Sweat that equity. Some, that is, yeah, that's what it is. Man, you got to put some sweat equity in, man. And, you know, I don't think people want to do that anymore at this age, time, uh, age and time and shit like that. So let's, let's talk more about your role, you know, how it changed, how your personal role and style changed from GA to director, man. Because I, I know for a fact – and we talk about it all the time as a staff, you know, your interns are going to act a certain way with the athletes. GA is a certain way. Your assistant's a different way than the head guy is going to be with his athletes, you know? So what, how did, how has your role changed and how have you been able to, you know, mold yourself into these positions? Yeah. So I think, I think through that process, there's a lot more alignment there than people realize as you're going through. But I mean, as an intern and even as a GA, I feel like, uh, I mean, your role is, already more supportive in nature versus the guy leading it and the assistants leading it. 
So the athletes are going to be a little bit more conversational than you, but that's also an opportunity for you to build a relationship with the guys. And that maybe they may tell you something that uh, they may not tell an assistant or may not tell a director. So that's information that you get to gather that they might not be able to. And you can relay that information and be like, Hey, this guy actually felt like shit today. He just, he didn't want to tell you. He didn't want to say anything. He was worried what you might say. So on. Um, but I think one of the other biggest things is that it, that exists when you go through those roles is the responsibilities change. You know, one of my mentors at Arkansas state, Phil Byer told me when I was an intern there, the amount of work never changes, but the type of work does. And that couldn't be more Mm -hmm. true, Mm -hmm. you know, as an, as an intern, you know, maybe your responsibilities are set up and break down a lift. So you got to clean up shaker cups, record data, enter data in the computer, um, assist the list however you can. And, and then, you know, you get some coaching experience on the floor. I was fortunate that I got a lot of coaching experience in the places that I interned at, but I know that's not the case for everybody. Yeah. Um, but then going from there, like you've got to own that role because you doing that job allows the people above you to take care of some other things that they need to take care of, you know, as a GA or even as an assistant, you've got pro programming responsibilities for your own teams. You've got to meet with the sport coaches that you're assigned to. You have to coordinate some intern duties. You may have some duties that you're taking off of the director's plate that you need to handle. So you as an intern taking care of these, what seem like minuscule grunt type work things allows the time for the assistant to take care of some things. And because the assistant can take care of those things, the director can take care of the big picture things. Right. And that's probably the biggest thing I've noticed changing from assistant to director is I've got a weight room budget. I've got to manage. I've got a nutrition budget. I've got to manage and make orders on. I've got to plan meals for home and away games, uh, there's staff meetings. I've got to go to meetings with the head football coach and go over what we're doing and what the plan is moving forward, what changes need to be made, meeting with athletic training to make those adjustments and then making your own adjustments for injured return to play. Shoot. Even, even talking to calling the recruits, like that's a whole nother aspect that's added on that you may not have had to do as an assistant, definitely not as an intern. Um, and I think you see people talk about, you know, we can do the best with athletes we're given, but at some point you got to recruit better athletes. Well, now you're a part of that process as a director. So you're, if, if, if you have the time now, because other people are freeing up your time to put in some, some good work and communicating with your recruits and you get them to sign, you just help the program get better. And you were able to help the program get better because the people that work under you did their roles and own their roles to the best of their ability. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, man. Lowest person on the totem pole, man. You got to just deal with the bullshit, man. I remember being an intern fucking just polishing racks, man. You know, and that shit sucks. No coaching, you know, but just building. I don't even know if you're building relationships at that point. You're just, (laughs) you know, you're just trying to break into the damn field, man. Um, but yeah, and you're trying to show that you work hard, but at the end of the day, and you know, I don't know how much, how well it's communicated that because they're doing that, you are still freeing up time for the overall program to get better. So you're supporting the whole program. feels like shit while you're doing it, maybe. Oh yeah. hundred percent, man. Showing that you're working your ass off and you're helping the whole program. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And you know, we, we try to explain that to our interns. It's like, Hey, look, you know, uh, if you have any questions, ask us. Don't ask the head guy, man, because he's busy doing, you know, like you said, he's, you know, budgeting. He's all this administrative shit that, you know, he really doesn't want to fucking do, but he has to because it comes with the job title, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hey, and, and, you know, I've been a part of some internships where it, they fucking sucked, man. Like, I didn't get the coach. I couldn't talk to a fucking kid. I'm just standing there with my fucking, you know, hands crossed, twiddling my fucking thumbs, you know, <laughs> Hey, go get a towel, you know, and I'm cleaning a fucking bar cause the kid's bleeding, you know, now I'm you know wiping this shit down. Cause you know, whatever. But, um, we try to use our interns as much as we can, man. Like we put them to work, like not week one, but week two It's like, Hey, you're coaching week two, man. Week one, you got, you know, X amount of hours to learn the shit. You know, we're not expecting you to memorize everything, but you know, learn the system, learn how, you know, some of our cues, learn some kids' names and then by week two, hey, man, you should be able to coach a squad up. You know, we're not saying it should be, you know, the best coaching in the world, but, hey, you should be able to tell the kid, hey, get lower. That's not low enough, you know? Exactly. 
simple things. Simple and things. Just, yeah. Um, What's your message for people getting into the field, interns that want to be, you know, GAs or assistants one day? Shoot, man. Work your butt off. Show that you want to be there and own your role. If you're the best at, at what they're asking you to do, they're going to give you more responsibility as they go. And that'll develop trust with those people. And, and then they'll go to bat for you when it's your time to, to go up for a position like that. Definitely, man. But yeah, let's talk about what you're doing, man. Football only. So what you got planned for him? Early 2021. Yeah, so, what's that? I said early 2021. What do you got planned for him? Early 2021. So I guess I'll start with where we started in January. You know, I, so I needed to come in and, and see some things, see what we had, what do we need to get rid of, what's coming in. So in the process of that, I took inventory of everything. So when I went home to Virginia, looked at the inventory, I start planning the program, I write out, you know, ideally what I would want to do. And based on my conversations with coach Cushing, what we wanted to do. And I can't tell you how many times that changed and a lot of things got cut, but at the end of the day, my message to myself was keep it simple. They're learning new things and we're having a new weight room that they're going to have to learn at the same time. So hmm. I just wanted to keep it simple and, and really rock the foundations. So I had two weeks basically to get them ready to practice. So the first two weeks, we went five days a week. I followed a high-low model, three high days, two low days on the Tuesday, Thursday. Um, Monday was our, our acceleration and change of direction on the field, in the weight room. Um, in the weight room, we did like horizontal power stuff. So we got our med ball throws in. We got new jammer arms. So that was brand new. We used some, some jammer pressing uh, to get some more horizontal type power work in there. It was new okay. for those guys. Um, and then we just went squat hinge, simple. Okay. Teach them how to do the, the basics right. Um, the other high day, which was our max low day, was our Wednesday. Um, we basically went three circuits. We had a sprint circuit, which was, you know, uh, we went constrained sprint drills. And it was really complex. So we'd do a 30-yard sprint with a dowel out in front, reinforce our, our vertical running positions, our front side action, foot strike, all of that. So we'd do that, and then we'd come back, rest two or three minutes. we put the dowel down. We're going fly 10 with a constrained 20-yard entry, hands on hips. And then we let the arms go and tell them, just let it fly for that last 10. And we'd get like two or three reps to that circuit. It was like seven minutes. Um, we just split up in position groups, skills, mids, bigs. Some would start on um, head ball, just vertical overhead throws. And then we had different progressions for the different positions on our hurdle jumps. Our skill guys went rhythm jumps and then continuous jumps. Our uh, mids went counter movement and rhythm, and then our, our bigs went non-counter movement, counter movement. And then our Friday was our, uh, our reactive agility day. It was, our, it was our basically football prep day because I only had one day of that style of training because the very next week we were starting practice on that day. So I was like, this is a one-off day. We're going to go through some reactive stuff. Now it's just within a context of, hey, I need to react to the person that I'm going against. Very simple. Just matching the demands of football and matching the demands of the sport. We would break up by positions and do it a little bit more position specific. And then in the weight room, that was my opportunity to teach our unilateral lower, our mids and skills. We started learning the skater squat. And then our bigs, we were going single leg squat to a bench. And then we would have a rhythmic movement with that. We went kettlebell swings. And then we just did some really basic timed sets on the upper body. Like we just did push-ups, band rows, band shrugs, 10-second blast, 20-second to rotate. And we'd rotate through that three, four, five times. Hmm. Just reading the kids and see how they felt. Um, so really it was high Monday, Wednesday, Friday, lower body emphasis. Friday was total. And then on our low days, we just did two different variations of tempo running. So just coaching our guys, look, it's, it's 65 to 70%. I want you guys to make it around this time. I don't need you much faster than this, but I don't want you much slower than this. Um, and we just had different distances based on the position. So our yardage volume was 720 yards for the bigs. 
our mids was 960 yards and our skills were 1200. And that was just the first week we needed to start them somewhere. Um, and the yardage on those two low intensity days was the same. We just had one was a short tempo day. Skills ran 25 yards, mids 20, bigs 15. It was 48 reps. The overall yardage of the rep was doubled on Thursday, but the reps were cut in half. So it was 24 total reps, skills running 50, mids running 40, bigs running 30. And honestly, they crushed it. They were like, holy crap, I've never run this many reps like this, Mm -hmm. but I feel fine. And that's exactly what I wanted. We needed to get them on their feet and start building some capacity. So that way, when they were on the field of practice, it at least mirrored similar energy systems. Yeah, and, you know, similar yardage capacity as well that they might see in, a, in the demands of a game too, you know? Exactly, and the uh, the short tempo day I think was a little bit closer to what they're going to see on, on game day uh-huh. where it's, you know, you're making that in four seconds, running clock is 20 seconds. It's a lot closer to the, the work-to-rest work, work to rest ratio they're going to see in the sport. And the sport coaches, actually, they ate that up. They're like, oh, this is so football-specific. And I'm like, and we're just getting them ready. We're just preparing for the sport. Can we, like you said, can we match the energy demand of the sport, number one? Number two, can we prepare the tissues for the impacts it's going to receive in the sport? And that's where specificity, to exactly. me, to me, that's where that comes in, you know? And I love what you're doing with football, man. Like, everything. I totally agree. Yeah, everything, you know adds up and makes sense. Like for one reason, um, with me, with my volleyball team, our conditioning is jump conditioning. You know, we're going to jump upwards of, you know, 600 times in that session. Now it's very low impact. It's like a pogo jump, but the specificity of the sport, we're preparing the tendons, preparing the tissue, preparing the ligaments to receive this impact, you know, the ankle, knees and hip. And I remember telling that to someone, they're like, God, Jesus, man, Gio, 600 times, that, that, that's too much. So I'm like, yeah, but it's very low impact. Like what's the difference if they're going to do it in a fucking game? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It's like, what, what are we going to say? Hey, coach, yep. coach, they jumped 200 times. We're only in the first set. Let's take them out of the game. No, fuck that. Wait, listen, if, like, there's, no, there's really not much research out there. So it's like when you do your own research, it's like, well, shit, if, if I'm seeing this, I better prepare for that. Exactly. Well, that's like, there's, you're seeing it a lot now with like the GPS stuff. I, I personally have, have never had access to that, but I've talked with some people and I mean, you rarely see football guys going over 90% unless it's an explosive play yeah. of max velocity. A lot of times it's in that gray in, in the, the 80 to 90% area and sometimes lower than that. And I feel like it's probably the same across a lot of sports, just the way the sport is structured. Like, like you're saying, a lot of the jumps in volleyball are low intensity jumps with very few minimal max effort jumps in there you know oh yeah 100 percent. you worked with volleyball down at uh was it tech or northwest yeah a lot of tech and northwestern oh, State. Both. okay okay yeah i guess it is what it is you know like i don't i don't like running my volleyball girls i'll be honest with you because their sport doesn't really demand it even though they do change direction but but i love the idea and the force that you have with the football guys man the high low little, little charlie francis model right there huh yeah i was i spent like the past year of covid working on the high low model on myself and different variations of it. So when I came here and, and talked to coach Cushing, I was like, look, we got two weeks. I was like, I know this is what you had before. And we had some circumstances that had to change what he wanted to do on the schedule anyway. Um, and I was like, look, do we need to do, do we need to spend next week doing a conditioning test and, and testing maxes coming off of a five week break or are you good if we just get ready for football? He was like, do what you think is best to get us prepared to play football. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do then. And here's why. I explained it. He was totally good with it. He said, let's go. I mean, that's, that's awesome. You got a guy on board with you. Because I know a lot of football coaches around the country just love chasing numbers. You know, hey, we got to get the benches up. We got to get the, you know, whatever. This is squats up. The speeds have got to be higher, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I think. I think one of the important things is having conversations with your coaches. It's like, Hey, I want to get those things, but I'm going to track those, some of those things every week anyway. So I'm going to get it regardless. Right. We just don't need to test it right now. Right, 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 right. It's funny. Cause I work with uh, our, our baseball program. You know, I work with baseball here. They, ha- they always hire this, like, <laughs> I hate to call him a nerd geek, but he is, he's a stats guy. So he runs like all these like, statistical analyses and shit, oh, shit yeah. like that. Baseball, the baseball stats guy. Man, I know what you're talking baseball about. Baseball fucking, they suck off stats so much, man. But anyway, this guy called me over winter break and he's like, hey, uh, can we test every two or three weeks? I'm like, dude, listen, number one, we're trying to win fucking games in the spring. Number two, I don't got fucking time to test every two to three fucking weeks. Jesus, man. But 
God, yeah, they just want fucking metrics and all this shit. I'm not a fan of that stuff, to be honest, Derek. Like, my testing isn't, can you complete all the fucking sets and reps in the weight room? Right. And we're jumping once a week on the jump, man. Can we, can we try to increase our, our vert by whatever, a small percentage every week? That's honestly what I'm doing, you know. I was going to dive into that anyway. So, yeah, at the end of the two weeks, I was like, okay, I didn't get to, like, I wanted to get some 10-yard sprint times. I, I would have loved to have gotten fly 10s in my situation just wouldn't allow for that. And I was like, you know, we just need to train these qualities anyway, get ready for football and we can worry about the numbers of it later. So at the end of the two weeks, just kind of worked it into the weight room. So the the flow was a little smoother. Uh I'm going to have to set aside extra time. Uh, One week I got a repeat from the guys. So I was able to get RSI ground contact time, all that. Next week, I was able to get one counter movement, and one non counter movement. So I basically created a jump profile for each guy. I can't see, you know, which is higher for them. Are they more force dominant? Are they more elastic dominant? Do they need work on speed, strength, strength speed, all of that? And it, it was pretty much what you expect. The skill guys are, are better at the elastic stuff, and the bigs are, are better at the force dominant stuff. Yeah. But there are a few outliers within that. You're like, okay. I can do some certain things with this guy to help improve his elasticity or maybe this guy has a lot of muscle tissue injuries. So I need to back off and do some slower strength based stuff to help build him on that end. Uh, but so we got those numbers and that, then we rolled into in season practices. Basically um, we were really smart about it though. Our coach did a really good job planning it. Those first two weeks we were training. We also had some walkthroughs of the script we were going to do it's less than 10 periods. So when we got back, it's not like it was a whole boatload of things thrown at them and they were just stressed out and fatigued week one. Did a really good job progressing it. Um, we lifted Monday, Friday, and those were only lift days. Kids had off on Tuesday, so I could really push them on Monday. You know, okay. that was our, our high intensity effort day. Like, I didn't have any power based stuff that day. I was like, we're going to do. It's going to be, quote, unquote, slower movements, strength movements. They've spent all weekend running, cutting, all of jumping on the field. I don't need to do that right now. So I'm going to work on the force side of things in the weight room. So we started off three weeks of front squat. We've got some hip mobility with it. Started doing Nordic hamstring holds. They had the day off the next day, so I wasn't concerned about <laughs> that being an issue. Rip those hamstrings and, up, man rip those hamstrings up and then we'd uh, get some upper body work in at the end. And um, Fridays for us was mostly upper body, but dynamic ish effort, lower body. They hadn't done any cleaning before. I didn't want to take the time to do that. The first two weeks we're preparing to play football. So we mostly use loaded jumps and other things. Okay as our speed and power anyway. So now that I've got the time to the season, we're going to start some clean progressions. So Friday, these first three weeks, we went just rack clean pull. It was something that Schwager and I did down at NSU and I saw some really good triple extension and really good use of hips from the athletes there. It seemed like they, they, they got it a little bit better. So we just started them above the knee rack clean pull. Uh, the next three weeks we'll go two plus one on that clean pull, clean pull, then we'll catch it. Um, but paired with that, we went incline bench, which is going to progress to bench after three weeks. And then after three weeks, it'll be our highest output or highest load on that. And we'll go rack bench before we drop down and peak at the end of season. Um, and that's also been the day that we've con- been continuing our skater squat progression as well. Shoot, we started off hand supported body weight and now almost all of our skill and big guys are either holding a plate or holding dumbbells, goblet. We're loaded now. Nice. Pattern looking good. I'm really happy with how that's come along. And honestly, the guys have eaten it up. You know, we have some good energy in the weight room. I'm like, man, you guys are looking good. We're squatting like athletes. And they love that. I'm like, yeah, I feel, I feel athletic. This feels good. Yeah. I'm like, okay, great. It's helping you. We'll keep pushing that. Um, so we're going to keep really rolling with that same setup. It's, it's a little weird because this spring semester we're going to play on Sundays versus really? Saturdays. That's, you know? All right, get your little NFL prep. NFL prep, exactly. You know? <laughs> so, so we're going to play Sundays and we're going to lift on Mondays, still off Tuesdays. The kids will always get off Tuesdays. Okay. And we'll have 
our, our Friday is getting moved back to Thursday. That's basically it. Um, and coming in, I did not have a lot of numbers on the guys. Really all we had was bench numbers and squat numbers. I took that. I made a really conservative training max on each. And then I used those to give me training maxes on other lifts. Like I took back squat and I was like, okay, here's the training max. Here's their training max for front squat. Here's their training max for trap bar deadlift. I just went 75% of back squat for front squat, 110% for trap bar deadlift. Um, and then did the same thing with bench press. I was like, okay, um, we'll go with a lower intensity for the first three weeks. So we went incline bench, 78% of, of our bench press. And then the rack bench is going to be 110, just like trap bar is. So that way, as we're going through the season, our main lifts are going to go in three week blocks. The relative intensity undulates, but the overall absolute intensity consistently progresses each week. So first three weeks were front squat incline. The next three weeks are back squat bench press. And then the last three weeks are trap bar rack bench. And then we've got two more games after that. And that's when we're going to drop down into some position specific uh, percentages based on velocity zones um, just to get some position specific velocity and power work. I don't have any tendos, but I just keep it simple. I'm like, okay, this range is speed strength. This is where the skills are going to be within this range. Right, right, work right. There. I, Max, just coach intent. Hmm. I got some. No. I got some secrets for you. I'm gonna keep off the podcast. Top, top, <laughs> All right. Confidential information. <laughs> I'm gonna send over love to it. you. <laughs> um. Nah, but that's dope, man. I love, I love what you're doing. I'm, I'm just fucking like soaking it all in right now. I'm like a fly on the fucking wall. And I guess the other thing I should mention is we are, I took the, the first two or three weeks to get those jump numbers and give me a baseline. So now as we go through season as well, there's built in adjustments that the guys are going to have. So we'll play that Sunday on May. They'll come in the afternoon. They'll weigh in with me and they'll jump with me before they go into position meetings and I'll be able to take the jumps and put them into the database. And then on their card, I'll be able to adjust. So for example, let's say where is it? one week we're supposed to do three sets of two, it's 76 to 81%. But their jump was, let's say their jump was below 90%. If their jumps below 90%, the volume is going to stay the same the relative intensity is going to stay the same because I'm just going to slide down the relative intensity scale, mm -hmm. but the overall, the absolute intensity is going to change. So three sets of two at 76 to 81 becomes set to three at 74, 79 relative intensity is the same. Overall intensity is lower. Gotcha. Okay. And then again, if they're below 80%, if they're even worse, it's instead of three sets of two, you're hitting one set of six at 68 to 72%. Over, the relative intensity is still the same as if it were the three sets of two, but the overall load on your body is going to be a little bit lower and allow you to recover a little bit better. Okay. I was just about to ask you, are you, are you trying to like, you know, recover sympathetic, parasympathetic activity with that stuff? Or is that, is that just something, exactly. something else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It'll still give them enough stimulus that we're at least going to be able to maintain strength and, and keep pushing strength as we go through. Yeah. But it's, it's a low enough overall intensity that it's, it's not going to blow their CNS in any more than it already is. Yeah. Have you, Oh shit. I'm not, I was about to ask you a question, but you haven't even gotten into the season yet. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> all right, I'm going to throw a question at you and get back to me in fucking May with an answer. Yeah. Let me know what your jumps are with your starters and the guys who didn't even see a snap. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm thinking right now your starters might be shot out, still riding on fucking high on Mondays. Um, Probably. Honestly, I'm you know, expecting that. I mean, we'll see your running backs, you know, you guys that are in the trenches, you know, taking a shit ton of load linebackers will probably be a little bit lower. Now I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, man, I say the other, the other challenge is we've got to be a little conservative with those guys because you never know who's going to get knocked out with the COVID testing. So all of these guys have to be ready to go. Oh, yeah. You know, even the backups, there's a chance that a backup guy is going to be a starter yeah. in a few days. You just never know. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. So, there's a, hey, got to keep the quarterback healthy. <laughs> got to keep Man. the quarterback. We were, we were talking about that as a staff today, how we're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, we, were, we were talking about this. I was actually talking about it with my father-in-law back in June last year. I was like, man, Col man, I was talking to this coach from uh, 
these colleges here, you know, this uh, you know, SEC coach I know, this Big Ten coach I know, man, they all said the same shit. Man, we got to keep our quarterback healthy. That's the only guy that can't go to him, bro. You know? Yep. I say our coaches were like, we may have to drive him separately from the bus in like the team van with guys that are within their 90 days to make sure that he can't get it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen, him all the way down. No knock on the backups, man. We love you backup QBs all around the world, but the starting quarterback is the number one position in all sports that if that guy goes down, your backup better be somewhat as equal, you know, with, with the way the game is now, no doubt. Yeah. Oh man, hey Derek, man, you you drop you drop some good gems on this one, man. I love it, man. I love that jump profile. I gotta I gotta talk to you a little bit more about that, you know, off off the podcast. I don't want I don't want you to drop all the secrets, man. All the top confidential <laughs> shit, man. You know. <laughs> yeah, we, we can, I, I'm just excited about it. I'm, I mean, it's gonna give me some some ways to adjust the guys based on how they're feeling. I'm also I'm gonna have a daily questionnaire on that: hours of sleep, meals, mood, all of that. Yeah. RPE with the lift. So I can see how the RPE and the jump matches up that way. I get the whole picture and it helps me start some conversations with those guys and see what they're doing. Um, but it's also going to give me a snapshot of, wow, is our power improving through the season or not? You know, yeah. it's going to give me both of those things at the same time. That, hey, hey, now that you're on that topic, look, I'm, I'm going to touch, touch a little bit of base on that. I track my sleep just in my volleyball team. Um, what else? Do I do daily questionnaires with everyone and RPEs. And it's funny because what you'll see over time is like people answer the same way on the RPEs and on the questionnaires. But I find that to be a good thing because when something happens and it's a sudden change, you're like, something's going on, you know? Yep. Like if I, exactly. like after every workout, if a guy keeps hitting a seven on RP, seven on RP, seven on RP, and then like three weeks down the road, bang, he hits like a fucking 10. I'm like, Something's going on. Now, he, now he's indicating, you know, personal stress is a five when he usually hits a two. I know something's going on, you know? Yeah. Well, that, and then you've got, you've got some of those kids that just aren't conversational and you ask him, how are you feeling today? And he's you're just like, I'm okay. And like, you, you, I don't know what I'm okay means, you know? Yeah. So when they quantify that and you can actually see it, you can go, oh, okay. You feel like a five. And you say your hamstrings are sore. Let's talk about that now. Like you, at least you wrote it out and I know specifically where you're at. Yeah, not definitely, man. I, listen, I love tracking all shit, man. If I could track what the fuck these kids eat 24 seven, I would, but I don't. That's a little too, <laughs> that's out of my league right there. But I say you can't throw too much on their plate either. Yeah. Already got, and I got, I got, I got a whole little like fatigue profile that I've started to develop too, which I, th I think it's going well. I don't know. It's brand. I'm trying all this brand new shit this year. Derek, you know, so I, and I, talk, I, I talked to you a while ago about the baseball program, how I'm doing that. So I'll, I'll give you more info on that in May when I, when I finally get through a whole damn semester with some, some good data, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I'm just trying some new stuff, man. Same, same thing that's been going on for years, you know, nothing new. I'm not recreating the wheel, but I'm trying to create my own version of it. So I don't know what I'm, exactly. I know exactly what the fuck I'm looking for, you know? I think I was going to say, I think that kind of plays into what we're going to talk about with context. X yeah. with, you know, not reinvent the wheel, but, but do it how you know how to do it. So exactly. Yeah. Context is absolutely everything. Like there's so much good content on social media, all sorts of web, simply faster, all that kind of stuff. Like there's so much out there that you can digest, read and see. Um, but you've got to know, do you know the concept of it? What purpose does it serve? how would you integrate that into what you already do? Like, do you, do you have progression and regressions that you could automatically go that type of thing? Um, and then you've got to consider, does that fit into the resources that I have, right? Do I have the manpower for that to happen? How many athletes are in my training session? Could I really pull that off with that number of athletes? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. What equipment do I have? What are the facilities like? How much time do I have flow? All of that goes into what are you going to put in the program? What are you going to, probably more importantly, what are you going to take out of the program? Those logistics matter more than a lot of people realize. Um, so you can see all sorts of stuff that look really great and really cool. And you're like, man, that would be ideal, but your situation is not always going to be ideal. So how do you take some of those things that you learn and apply it? And I know COVID was a really good time for that, right? The co coaches versus COVID-19 dropped a lot of podcasts started up. So there's a lot of content to digest. 
And my boss at the time and I, we started listening to a podcast every day. We'd break it down, go over it. And I guess like one of the examples of that is we listened to a podcast from Keith Barr, Tendon Health. And, and I, I don't want to speak for him or, or what his podcast was and all of his other information because people can find that too. But essentially slow movements help tendon health and muscle strength and fast movements make the tendon stiffer, yep. um, which helps improve performance on the field. Um, so once COVID shut down, I was, I was out of the weight room. I only had access to a track. I was like, okay, well, I can do some body weight stuff. I can sprint and I can jump. So first day of COVID, I go out and sprint. Last step of my last rep on my sprint, pop my hamstring. I was like, holy crap. It was like, it was one of those ones where it hurt so bad that I like, I lost my hearing and my orientation. I had to like sit down Jeez. for a second. I was like, <laughs> Damn. I was like, holy crap. I was like, this sucks. Now I can't go through COVID and lift and train. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have to take everything that I've been looking at lately and learning and start applying it now. So mm -hmm. next day I just started with some really low level isometric holds, right? I started doing split squat holds, any variation I could find body weight squat holds. Uh, the one that worked for me on the hamstring, bringing it back really quickly was a single leg glute bridge hold and started off heel close to butt. And I'd work out until it was at length, right? Because I knew I injured it at length and I knew once I got it at length, and that's where there was a lot of tension and yes, started to get a little bit more uncomfortable, right? So once I got into those uncomfortable positions, I started to progress time. And as time progressed and it got stronger, I just kind of started to build from there, right? So I started with ISOs and I started doing holds. Now I started actually doing the body weight movements started to do, you know, maybe some acceleration drills, the posture of marches, that kind of stuff. Then once it got stronger, I was able to various things where I started plyos and low intensity running. Then once I was good there, started off with really short sprints and tempo running. I was like, okay, I just listened to the coaches versus COVID-19 and the high low model and, and all those guys did a really great job presenting that. So I was like, I, I'm going to take it and apply it now just to see how it feels. The tempo running brought back the distance without it being at such a high intensity. So I built up a lot of contacts and a lot of repetitions with correct form or as correct form as I could achieve. So that way, when I did start sprinting at high intensities again, it was good to go. And then in that time, I got the job at NSU and I was able to go into the facility, so able to start lifting again. And then I was able to truly start that high-low model and me toying around with it there until I was able to sprint fully again is basically what set the foundation for what I did here with these guys and is really going to be something that we're probably going to do moving forward when we get back into the summer. That's awesome. I, I love the high-low model, man. It's something I'm experimenting myself with right now with the uh, with my volleyball uh, team, being that we're in season. So, you know, um, and I've had, you know, many conversations with the coach and he's trying to – it's funny because, like, he'll get me involved in, like uh, – practice planning, which is pretty dope. But yeah, high, low model, I think it works well. You can't be all, you know, fucking high, 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 three, four fucking days in a row because now you're just, Jesus Christ, man, burnouts, man, no, real, man. I've been man. there, man, shoot. You know, talking about having no desire to fucking train no more. That sucked, but. Yeah, time time plays in all that too. It's like, yeah, because I don't want people to get this twisted. Like high, low model was good for what we were doing right then. Exactly, it's not yes. It's what we're doing yes. right now. And it might not be good for a certain time frame when we come back. Right. But you got to figure out what's going to work for the time frame, the number of days you get, where your athletes are at. All of that has to play a factor into what you're going to use and what you're going to implement. I throw this in there, you know, velocity based training. Hey, look, freshman, you're not using it. I'm sorry, man. Gym wars look cool. You get to play with the iPad during the session. Guess what? Seniors and juniors only, man. They developed enough maximal strength to, you know, get to this, you know. Exactly. Same thing, triphasic or, you know, block training, whatever the hell you want to call it, you know. Yep. You know, hey, there's a certain time of year to implement those methods. You know, five, three, one, a certain time of year to implement those methods, you know? Yep. A, a one by 20 APRE is the same kind of thing. Yeah. You got to find out where that fits. Where does it fit in exactly? And, you know, who, who, how much are you dosing with who and what? You know, who could tolerate it, who can't? But, you know, that's, exactly. that, that's when, you know, you really know your guys and you say, hey, this guy can tolerate this. Hey, look, we got one guy on our fucking football team snatching. You know, just because he could, he could do it, number one. Number two, he's got a wrist issue, you know, that, you know, won't allow him to catch a clean properly. So, all for it, man. You know, this guy's working it. But, yep. anyway, 
Outside of that, man, Derek, man, loved having you on, man. This is great shit you brought on. So, Derek, if some of my listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get in contact with you, man? Yeah, so my Instagram is at Coach DJ Stein. They can reach out to my email on EIU's website. And- loved having you on, Derek. This is good stuff, man. Appreciate you taking the time off as well, man. But uh, one last question, man, before I let you go, man. If you weren't a strength coach today, what other career do you see yourself doing? Shoot, man. I Don't w- fucking say teacher, man. Do- Don't say fucking teacher, man. Too many guys use that. Well, I wasn't going to say Fuck teacher, that. but I would, I would honestly, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being 100% honest, I'd probably be standing right next to my little brother right now coaching a high school wrestling team. Not, oh, all right. A little wrestling. You got some wrestling blood in you? Yeah, man. Yeah, we both grew up wrestling. He ended up sticking with wrestling and wrestling in college, and, and now he's coaching at a local high school back home. So nice. I try to probably where I'd be. I try to wrestle my senior year of high school. I just couldn't afford the equipment. It was, you know, a little bit over 200 bucks. And, you know, I'm not saying we were fucking Jeez. poor or anything like that, but my mom was like, we ain't paying for this shit. I'm like, all right. We're not paying for that. Right. Yeah. And nobody, I'm guess I'm not putting nobody in a fucking headlock then. <laughs> <laughs> nope. nope. Dude, man, that's, that's dope, man. Good stuff, though. But, um, hey, Derek, man, appreciate you again, brother. Uh, I appreciate you having me on, Joe. That was awesome.